Welcome. How wonderful it is to all be going through this teaching together as a, as a family of Harvest. Join me in prayer, please. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. And we pray that you'd give us receptive hearts, open minds to, to receive it. You would speak to us in a willingness, Lord, to follow in obedience what you teach us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, I want to start out with a quiz, if I could. I have a quiz for you. It's an easy quiz. We have questions and then A, B, C answers. Are you ready for it? Are you ready for it, really? Okay, here we go. What is the purpose of life? A, have fun. B, be productive. C, bring glory to God. Good, good job, good job there. Okay, next question. Who is in control of our lives? A, chance, B, I am, or C, God is? C, very good, very good. And now the third and final question. How can you succeed in life? A, um, do your best to have a positive attitude no matter what happens. B, Make sure you don't do anything embarrassing. And C, trust someone who knows the whole story. C. Now, the answer to all those questions was C, but you know that, right? So life should be pretty easy, okay? You know to bring glory to God. You know that he's in charge. You know to trust him. Nothing more to say. You guys can leave. Go ahead. Leave now. Well, it's really not that easy, is it? Because we have a sin nature, we struggle with wanting to be in charge. We want to be in control. We want to know where we're going, and we want to know when we're going to get there. And I think about this, and I think about, I think about my kids. I think about my grandkids. And they are just illustrations of what takes place in my own heart. But I am answer C or B in that last question and just don't embarrass myself. But they don't mind doing that. My little grandson, Jack, three years old, so cool, love him, lights up when I walk into the room. He thinks I'm a hero. He hasn't learned any better yet. And I think he's a hero. We fist bump and smile at each other. But when you tell Jack something he doesn't want to hear, you know what he says? No. Period. No. Not going to do it. Or if... Uh, he doesn't like something, he will immediately start crying really loud. Doesn't matter where we are, in a restaurant, no matter what. What if we all did that as adults? Something happens we don't like. We just start crying really loud. Maybe the bill comes at a restaurant. All of us, ah! you know, crying, and the waitress has to go, no, it's okay, little mister, it's okay. But he doesn't mind doing that. And lately, one of the things that he hates the most is the freeway. He doesn't want to go on the freeway. He hates it. He wants to get there. He wants to go where he wants to go, but he wants to call the shots on how to get there. And maybe he knows more than us. I mean, we're all going 75 miles an hour down the road, you know, just a hand's breadth away from somebody we don't even know. Maybe his eyes are open and we've just gotten numb to that fact, but he hates the freeway. But then my older grandkids are a little more sophisticated. And their issue isn't so much no or cry or I don't like the freeway. It's why. They want to know why for everything. I want to get this. No. Why? I, why is this? Why is that? Why is the other? And we tend to be like that, don't we? With the Lord. The Lord is in charge of our lives. We know we should trust him. And, and we wrestle with it when we should be resting in him. And we're going to be looking at a passage tonight that really illustrates this. Because we're going to see how an individual had to go through a process of suffering, surrender, and then song. Please turn to 1 Samuel chapter 1. You know we're studying the life of Hannah. And you've probably wondered as you turn there, why are we going through the life of Hannah? Aren't we studying the life of David? Well, this story sets up the life of David. Matter of fact, if we could write a headline for this narrative in Scripture, it would look something like this. Barren woman brings forth prophet who anoints King David, who brings forth Messiah who saves the world. 
That's the narrative. That's what we're looking at. But we find in this passage huge faith lessons that this needle of faith had to thread through the story to get to the point where we could pick up and look at the men after God's own heart. It, one of our passages that we studied uh, just recently in our World Changers series, as Pastor Greg has been teaching us, is without faith it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11.6. Without faith it is impossible to please God. So as we look at Hannah, we're going to see that she didn't have cliff notes on her life. She didn't get to the end of the story like we can easily and know how it's all going to turn out. She did not get any kind of warning. God didn't come to her and say, Hannah, I'm not going to give you what you want, but trust me, eventually we'll get there. So this is a study on trust, even in the dark. So what Hannah wanted is she wanted a son to take away her disgrace, but what God wanted was a prophet to lead his people out of sin. You see how the plans were different and God's plan was bigger? Here's my first application for us. God's plan is always bigger than we know. We go through stuff and we think we know the whole picture. We think we get it. But God's plan is bigger. God is going to do amazing things through your testimony and through your life. And you need to Get your mind around that. As a matter of fact, I've got a passage. We already turned to 1 Samuel chapter 1. I've got a passage I'm going to flip over to, and I just want to read it really quick. It is in Ephesians 2, 4, and this is what it says there. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even while we were dead in trespasses, has made us alive together with Christ by faith, or by grace, you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable, immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ. So in the ages to come he might show. So in the ages to come he might show. We're studying Hannah's life. She didn't know we would study it. But maybe someday in the ages to come, we'll be looking at your story and your story and your story. And God's plan was bigger and it unfolded and it glorified him so that in the ages to come, we will be amazed by it. That's a wonderful idea. So let's look at this passage as we turn over to it, as we look at it. Let me set it up. This is the last phase of the judges phase in Israel history. It was the Wild West in Israel. Idolatry was rampant. The enemies around Israel were dominating them. God would raise up a rescuer, and because it was the last resort for the people, they would flock to him, or that, that rescuer that God would appoint. And really, the ultimate passage is Judges 21, 25, where it says, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That's the backdrop of, of what we're looking at here. So now I want to look at this narrative and see what it has to say. We're going to start at verse 2. We have some opening comments about one of the main characters, Elkanah. But then in verse 2 it said, it says, his two wives, here he had two wives, the name of the one was Hannah and the name of the other one was Peninnah. And Peninnah had children and Hannah had no children. Now, this man used to go up year by year, to the, year by year to the city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hopni and Phinehas, were the priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters, but to Hannah he gave a double portion, because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as they went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not 
more to you than ten sons? Verse 9, after they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting at the seat beside the doorpost uh, of the temple of the Lord. So she wept. So she was deeply distressed and she prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look upon the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. And she continued praying before the Lord, and Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was not was speaking in her heart; only her lips, uh, only her lips moved, and the voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman and said to her, "How long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you." And Hannah answered, "No, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink." But I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman. Uh, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. And Eli answered and said, Go in peace. And the God of Israel grant you your petition that you have made. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your eyes. And the woman went her way and ate. And her face was no longer sad. And they rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. And they went back to the house of, at Ramah. And Elkanah knew his wife. And the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel. For the Lord, she said, I have asked of him from the Lord. Great passage. Wonderful narrative. But it starts off being a very sad story about suffering Hannah who was the beloved first wife of Elkanah, and she was barren. She had no children. And one presumes that Peninnah, the second wife, was added to the family as kind of a surrogate mother in order that the name of Elkanah would continue and that he would have an offspring and an inheritance. It was a common practice back then, but we need to note that though polygamy was permissible, it was never optimal. God's plan was always one man, one woman for life. And the Bible is full of illustrations of how polygamy messed things up. It was never a good idea. Add one wife, divide your joy, and multiply your sorrows. That's kind of how it was. So when we see that time and time again, but still, Hannah was barren. And this was thought to be a disgrace. This was thought to be a curse. And I think that's an odd perspective because the Bible is full of chosen women of God who struggled with this very thing, and God worked it in his plan. So we have illustrations like Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Ruth, Elizabeth, over and over again. We see this repeated, but still, it was thought to be a curse of the Lord and a disgrace. And I want to pause right here, and I want to say that God has a special plan and place for couples who struggle with infertility. This is a painful, painful place to do, and there's a place to be. There's lots of waiting there's lots of wondering. There's lots of heartache there. But in God's hands, it's pain with a purpose. God will do a miracle, whether that miracle is granting your wish and giving you a child naturally or the miracle of adoption. And I've prayed for gals who've been barren for years, and they've had kids eventually. I've prayed, and sometimes that prayer is not answered, and the miracle of adoption takes place, and I've got to say that I've seen both, and they're a blessing. As a matter of fact, my mother-in-law is a barren woman. She couldn't have kids, agonized for years over it, and then adopted a little blonde-haired, blue-eyed girl, and uh, she lived about three blocks away from me. So I was blessed by that adoption, it was a miracle. And without that, I never would have gotten to know that one right there. Hi, honey. My sweet, my sweet little adopted baby. 
<laughs> so I'm so blessed. But I just want to say, give it to the Lord. He will answer you. Seek his face. And it's pain with a purpose. But on top of her pain, Hannah, she had a tormentor. This piece of work, Penina. Piece of work, Penina. Always harassing her. What did she do? We don't get the exact words, but she irritated her and bugged her. And I think she did everything. Every look, every word, every innuendo, every opportunity. And you know what? I believe, men, there's a language we just don't speak. It's, a, it's, it's things that ladies understand, but we don't get. Have you realized that? My wife will say, did you see that? No, I didn't. Well, you know what that meant? No, I don't. Well, this meant that. Are you sure? <laughs> then later on, see, I told you were right. I never got it. I had no clue this was going on. There is this, this, this I don't know, it's supersonic. It's like quiet texting. It's, it's something. So this is what Han, uh, Penina was up to. She was constantly tormenting Hannah. And Elkanah was a devout man. He was a devoted man in a bad time. He went up to worship every year at the prescribed time to do what the Lord had called him to do. But it would have been easy for Elkanah to blow off worshiping the Lord because he was living in a secular culture. He knew the priesthood was corrupt. If you look just a couple chapters ahead, you find that it was a mess. God was not speaking according to 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. And no doubt it was because of the disobedient uh, people and the disobedient priests, so we recognize that. And then there was discord as in, in his own family. Hannah had a heavy heart. She was suffering. And sometimes it drove her to, to distraction. And then his other wife piece of work, Penina, was in rebellion to God and in rebellion to him. So here's the question, men. What do you do when the stuff that you are supposed to do just doesn't seem to work? I do this stuff, Lord. I'm being obedient to you. I'm following you. I'm praying for my family. I'm bringing him to church. It's not working. My kids are in rebellion. My wife is not happy. The situation is bad. It's getting worse. What am I supposed to do? Men, keep it up. Let me tell you this. If Elkanah had not kept it up, we wouldn't be reading the story right now. It all hinged upon his obedience to the Lord and be the man that God called him to be, regardless of how people responded. So that's my word for us guys. Keep it up. Keep going. Because we recognize that God had a plan. So, Hannah. She was on a downward spiral. She was disgraced, harassed, depressed, hopeless. But notice, the text says that the Lord closed her womb. The Lord was doing this. You know, the hardest part about suffering can be not knowing why, not knowing how long, not knowing what is next, and even worse when you forget the who involved, the, that God's hand is in this, and we can trust in him even through it. So she was having a difficult, difficult time. So we recognize the Lord closed her womb, which means she was not bearing this cross for nothing. You know, it doesn't make sense when we have to bear these crosses. They are painful. In verse 7 we see, she wept and she would not eat. Oh, she was out of it. Elkanah consoled her. He gave her a double portion, which was the portion to the firstborn, the inheritor. The, the one who would inherit from the father, that probably made Peninnah even angrier. So, but he gave that to her to console her. He said, what's wrong? Eat something. Am I not better than ten sons? And maybe you ladies think, well, he was just trying to fix her. He was just trying to placate her. He was just trying to, to fix the problem. How many of you men are fixers? 
Your wife comes out, she pours out her heart and says, oh, this is going on, this is going on, this is going on. And you say, well, do this, this, and this, problem solved. I didn't want you to tell me that. That's not why I shared this with you. Okay, what do you want me to do? I just want you to know. I just want you to, to be aware. Okay, you sure you don't want to fix this, this, and this? <laughs> no. Well, this is kind of what Elkanah was doing, but let me say this. He loved her. He gave her good counsel. Eat something. Sometimes that's really good counsel. Sometimes our emotions are wrapped up in eat something. Oh, I feel so much better after I ate something. Well, yeah. And then the other thing is he got her into the house of the Lord. He was doing the right things, so we need to give him that. Sometimes we carry our crosses and forfeit our consolations. God gives us consolations when he gives us crosses. People who love us, people who give, adv give us advice, people who give us his word, but we sometimes dismiss it and say, yeah, but you don't understand. There's no way you can know what I'm going through. There's no way you understand what's happening here. Easy for you to say. But you know what? God gives us those consolations and we need to listen because sometimes we want to wallow in the mire because we're not hearing the solution to the problem that we want. So we need to carry our crosses and we need to count our consolations. We need to thank the Lord for even the little bit of help that comes along. And I believe that's what Hannah was doing. And we have this pivot point in verse 9 in the narrative where the suffering is turned to surrender. We read there that she rose to the doorpost of the temple. And she went before the Lord. And she poured out her soul to the Lord, weeping bitterly. She talks about it being a time of great anxiety and vexation. She's pouring out her heart to the Lord. You know, expressing honest pain to the Lord is not sin as long as we honor him in that expression and don't bring a false accusation. God wants us to be honest with him. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast your cares upon him because what? He cares for you. He cares for you. He wants to hear it. And this is again where we move from a sufferer to a surrenderer. The temple is a place of offering. The temple is a place of sacrifice. The temple is a place of giving over in honor of God, whether it's giving of your funds or giving of your animal sacrifice, which in those days was a form of funds. It was your income. You were giving something very valuable to the Lord. It was giving of your time to get there. It was giving honor to the Lord. The temple was a place of sacrifice. And here is Hannah at this place of sacrifice saying, Lord, I'm going to give it to you. Lord, this is yours. Lord, this is too much for me to bear. She takes it to the Lord. She pours out her heart. She rolls it over to him. And she said, God, this is your, she says, God, this is your business, not my business anymore. Your lesson has Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 in it, which says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not lean to your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. She gave it to the Lord. She turned it over. And we recognize that she had a motive. She had a vow. She had a very specific thing that she gave to the Lord as an offering of worship to him. She says, okay, Lord, it's no, about, no longer about me. It's about you. If you do this, you'll get the glory. If you do this, it'll be for your use. If you do this, if you give me a child, he's yours. He will be a Nazarite. We know this because she says a razor will not touch his head. And there was this vow that you could make with your child as a parent that says, I'll dedicate him to you, Lord, for his use. And the Nazarite vow is no razor on the head, no spirits or alcohol in his life, no touching of dead things dedicated to the Lord. There were three Nazarites that we know of in Scripture. Samson, who was a Nazarite, 
but not a very good Nazarite. Samuel is the other one. And the final one is John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Amazing that these parents gave their children unto the Lord and then these children grew to give their lives unto the Lord. And from the time she made that vow, her countenance changed and she was a changed woman as she left. This was a big faith commitment for her. I mean, she was going to literally give this kid, we find, as soon as, as he was weaned over to the temple service. And here are these guys, Eli, Hopney, and uh, what was the third? Phineas, who were in charge, who were totally out of control. She was trusting the Lord with people who were out of control. Eli was a fat man, ruled by his appetite. We see that he fell backwards and broke his neck, and the Bible describes that he was a man ruled by his appetite, who raised sons who were not only ruled by their appetites, but their lusts. Some even think that they were priests of pagan gods as well as priests of the Lord. And the things that they did in the temple were absolutely disgusting. So here's Eli. He sees Hannah. And he's so undiscerning that he takes her devotion for debauchery. He accuses her of being drunk. And she has to say, no, 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 no. You got this all wrong. And she explains her prayer. She explains her her vow, and Eli finally gets it and says, go in peace, the God of Israel grant your petition. Now we don't know whether he did that to blow her off, to pacify the situation, or he knew this was the word of the Lord. He was speaking to her, but God knew what it was, and Hannah received it as the word of the Lord, and in verse 19, we see that Hannah is remembered by the Lord, and God blessed Hannah with that little baby, Samuel. And then Samuel would be, grow up to be unique in Israel. He would hear the voice of God that was silent for so many years. He would be a prophet unto the Lord. He would be a kingmaker. He would be a warrior. He would be a man like no other. I love the way that he listened to the Lord in an audible way. You can look over in chapter 3 where he hears the voice of the Lord for the first time, gets up and goes to Eli and says, you called me. And he does it a couple of times. And then Eli finally goes, no, I, I didn't call you. Next time you hear that voice say, speak, Lord, your servant hears. And it was the voice of the Lord that this young man was hearing. Amazing. And it was the voice of the Lord time and time again. We see in the narrative in 1 Samuel. It was the voice of the Lord when Saul was rejected as king where God called Samuel to go anoint and find another king. And he went to the home of Jesse where God directed him, looked at all those sons and said, this is the one, this is the one, this is the one. But he heard the voice of the Lord. The voice of the Lord said, don't look on the outward appearance. I look on the heart. That's your man. This little shepherd boy, this ruddy little guy, that's your man. Because Samuel heard the voice of the Lord, David was anointed. We'll study his life, but more to the point, the promised Messiah comes from the lines of David. The true king is anointed, kind of in symbolism that we find here. So amazing, amazing guy. We see this process. We see sorrow, surrender, and in verse excuse me, chapter 2, you can overview the, so the song that uh, Hannah sings. She becomes her own little psalmist. She sings about the Lord being her strength in verse 1, her rock in verse 2. Verses 3 through 7 are devoted to Peninnah, I think. The Lord is my answer. He vindicated me. He gave me a child. I don't know if she sang it that way or not, but maybe that's my own interpretation. It was a great psalm of worship. Forgive me for making light of it. Verse 8, the Lord is her foundation. And verse 10, the Lord is her king, the anointed one. And she speaks prophetically again about the coming Messiah. So, application. Where are you at? Trust in the Lord. That's what Hannah teaches us. He is worthy. Trust in the Lord. If you're going through suffering, surrender it to the Lord. If you're going through anything, surrender it to the Lord. He is worthy. And again, 
the plan in your life is bigger than you think. Amen? Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this great story of your people being led and directed by you and the great work that you did in Hannah's life and Samuel's life. And we pray, Lord, that we would find application, we would trust in you, we would follow after you, that we would constantly be in a a state of surrender, resting in you knowing that you are truly worthy of being in charge in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.